I want to talk about a number of points. How the British referendum pledge came about, the underlying reasons for UK dissatisfaction, and how what we might call the, the phony war, which has now become a real war in the campaign, has been conducted. Uh, behind all of that, what's really gone wrong in the European Union? Then the likely outcome of the, of the referendum. And finally, how that outcome might and should and also will not uh, affect either the United Kingdom and Europe. Well, the referendum itself is the result of a political miscalculation by David Cameron, the British Prime Minister. Cameron's Bloomberg speech on the 23rd of January 2013, in which he promised a referendum, was devised as a way of spiking the guns of the United Kingdom Independence Party. The expectation at that time, including Cameron's own expectation, it's quite clear, was of another coalition between the Conservatives and the Liberal Democrats. Now, the Liberal Democrats, if that had come about, would have stopped Cameron uh, acting on this pledge, as they had stopped him uh, acting, for example, on a pledge to, to reform human rights legislation in the UK. But, um, in fact, of course, the Conservatives won big. Uh, the Liberal Democrats uh, lost badly, and so Cameron is in the unfortunate, politician, unfortunate position for a politician of having to fulfil his promises. Well, the Bloomberg speech is a very ambitious speech. Uh, like Mrs Thatcher's speech, uh, a more well-known speech, uh, uh, at Bruges in 1988, and with even less chance of success in the programme that it put forward. Cameron calls uh, not just for a renegotiation of Britain's position in the European Union, but of, for a fundamental reform of the European Union itself. And his main points related to, first of all, competitiveness, including the reduction of bureaucracy. Secondly, to flexibility, including ending the commitment to ever closer union. In other words, moves towards a United States of Europe. Thirdly, he refers to the need for power to flow back to individual member states from the center. And he even went so far as to question the right of Europe to legislate, as he put it, on the environment, social affairs, and crime. So that is a very far-reaching point indeed. Fourth, he talked about the need for a bigger role for national parliaments. And fifth, he talked about fairness, by which he meant <coughs> fairness for those like Britain, which were not in the Euro and part of the Eurozone, but which were still subject to European-wide institutions. And of these points, <coughs> only the last, as you can see, was specifically um, oriented towards the United Kingdom. The others were for a fundamental shake-up of the system. Well, predictably, absolutely nothing came of these proposals for reform of the European Union. So all the focus henceforth has been on the rest of what was in that speech, where he hesitantly, but I must say, to my mind, astonishingly, promised this referendum. Cameron made it clear <coughs> that the present situation for Britain in the European Union was unsatisfactory. But he also asked to be given time to renegotiate. Some of his leading ministers went even further. The British Foreign Secretary, Philip Hammond, said, and I quote, the status quo is simply not acceptable. The status quo is not in Britain's interests. If the offer by the European partners is nothing, no change, no negotiation, I am pretty clear, he said, what the answer of the British people in the referendum is going to be. Well, the offer from the EU wasn't, of course, precisely no change, no negotiation, but it was, again, quite predictably, almost no change, 
uh, and as much negotiation as you want. Obviously, the details <coughs> of what was sought by Britain and what was granted, or at least apparently granted, uh, are of more interest to a British than to a Hungarian audience. But it's also worth noting that they are of actually very limited interest to a British audience either, since opinion polls show that very few people in Britain believe that Britain gained, that Cameron gained anything of note in these negotiations, which were, I have to say, to my mind, even more farcical than those conducted by the British Labour government, which I remember well, in 1975, before the previous referendum. <coughs> But here, anyway, are some points about this process. The Prime Minister had earlier promised that he would get what he called <coughs> a complete opt-out from the EU Charter of Fundamental Rights. That promise has been forgotten. Immigration was and is a key factor in the debate. And it's clear to anyone who thinks about the matter that while the EU's fundamental freedom of movement of people is retained, something which is inherent in the whole European project, Britain cannot control who comes into the country. Immigration is currently running at several times higher than Cameron pledged it would be. But the United Kingdom cannot, for example, restrict EU immigration for certain categories of person and open up immigration to more economically useful incomers from outside the EU, for example, from parts of the Commonwealth, while keeping an overall control. As what would only ever have been a minor contribution to restricting immigration, Cameron promised before the election, and I quote, we will insist that EU migrants who want to claim tax credits and child benefit must live here for a minimum of four years, end of quote. But what he's got from the EU is no more than what's described as a welfare emergency break, controlled by the EU Commission and not by Britain, subject to the rulings of the European Court, and anyway, temporary, because it will only last for seven years. Cameron also promised to stop sending child benefit abroad, this pledge has been dropped. The government promised to secure legal safeguards to stop non-Eurozone -Euro countries being penalised in decision-making by the rest. But it didn't get them, and what we have instead is a delaying mechanism. Now, under the renegotiated terms, it will be no easier to block EU laws, despite a promise to make it so. The claim that the EU, that the UK, now has what Cameron calls a special status in the EU is meaningless. We do have a different position, but that different position reflects the fact that we are outside the Euro and not part of the Schengen Agreement. But both of those things are thanks to Margaret Thatcher and not anything achieved as part of David Cameron's negotiation. The Prime Minister promised to get what he called full-on treaty change to guarantee the limited concessions that he secured. But there is, in fact, no treaty change. Indeed, the decisions reached between governments in this negotiation are explicitly said to be in conformity with the treaties. Any treaty change has been postponed sine die. So the renegotiation is not, as the government claims, legally binding, because, as the UK Justice Secretary has pointed out, and I quote, the European Court of Justice is not bound by the agreement. Well, I think that says enough about the referendum uh, uh, negotiation uh, and where we are at the moment. But I want to go back to something which I think is actually more interesting, and that is the underlying reasons for UK dissatisfaction. And here we enter the realms of history rather than spin. In 1973, 
Britain entered the European common market as it then was. Uh, the country did so on a false prospectus, and indeed initially without a referendum, which only occurred two years later. The terms of Britain's entry were bad. Britain lost control of its waters, which helped destroy its fishing industry. It accepted a system of agricultural support that benefited France at our own farmers' expense. Membership weakened the trading ties with the British Commonwealth. And above all, Britain became an ever-growing net contributor to the European budget and with no effective means of controlling the bills. <clears throat> Most importantly, British politicians wrongly portrayed Europe at the time as the answer to all or almost all of the country's difficulties, which were many. Europe, they said, would give Britain a role in the world after the collapse of empire. Entry, they said, would give our industry's markets. Competition, they promised, would make our trade unions more sensible and so our economy more efficient. In short, we would all become like Germans and enjoy a German standard of living. But it didn't happen. Britain in Europe lurched between crisis and unresolved crisis, and it had to be a British government, often at loggerheads with Europe, in the 1980s, which reformed the British economy. And over the decades since, there's been an ever louder rumble of discontent. Well, behind that, there is, of course, another question. What has really gone wrong in the EU? Now, the first thing to grasp, and I'm afraid that this may be shocking to some people, but therefore, unfortunately, the truth can be a little shocking on occasion. The first thing to grasp is that Europe, as presently organised, is neither liberal nor democratic. Nor was it ever intended to be, and nor, may I add, is it ever going to be. And that's why we may have to live with it, and we may even have to live in it, but we really shouldn't embrace it as a model. Liberty and democracy both depend for their successful operation on the same thing, namely public opinion. And nowadays we're inclined to pass lightly over that concept and associate it merely with the findings of opinion polls. But its significance needs to be grasped more deeply. Over the centuries, the size of the politically aware and influential section of the population in our countries has grown. But public opinion was always expressed in a shared national language. It was always formed by conducting a debate about the national interest. It was always manifested through national parties and it always affected national institutions. The European Union is based squarely and obviously upon a negation of those assumptions. The EU is heavily centralised. It is, in practice, controlled by a largely unaccountable group. What are portrayed as democratic institutions on closer investigations are nothing of the sort, simply because they do not properly represent national public opinion. Public opinion is not even today transnational. It's based upon inherited loyalties and assumptions and concrete goals and voiced by specific accountable individuals, and this isn't what happens in Europe. What we find, for example, in the European Parliament is a set of transnational alliances organised by people who may or may not share certain ideological positions, but whose electorates feel and have almost nothing in common. And most of those people could not, in all probability, even understand each other's language. Power is thus, as a result, largely, in practice, unfettered. It's in the hands of an elite whose members quickly find that they have more in common with each other than they have with those who elected them. 
And if individuals in the parliament resist this pressure to conform, they often find themselves excluded from influence and portrayed as cranks, extremists, and reactionaries. Now, over the years, we've heard a great deal about the so-called democratic deficit in Europe, but this, you know, is largely a ploy. Uh, it's used to suggest that giving ever more power to the European Parliament and less to the Council of Ministers uh, is the answer. But the European Parliament, in national terms, represents very little, and the Council of Ministers does exist, at least to enter when it has a sufficient majority on one particular issue to do so, to enter a veto. <coughs> now, all this isn't just incidental. It has practical effects. Politics does have practical effects. Today's ongoing and apparently never-ending crisis in the Eurozone came about because the system is based upon suppressing liberty and denying democracy. It would have been solved earlier if a different liberal model had been chosen and if national electorates had been in the driving seat. Now, that possibility was available. It was put forward by Mrs Thatcher in a well-known speech she delivered when she was in office in Bruges in 1988, and I was marginally involved in this. But her option at the time was decisively rejected, and it's not likely to be reconsidered except in the conditions of a catastrophic collapse. It is, though, of historical interest, and I'm going to outline it. This Bruges model would have been both liberal and democratic. It would have ruled out the euro altogether. Germany would have kept the Deutschmark, which within part of Europe would, in effect, have acted as a common but not a single currency. Other countries could have found their own monetary solutions within, with their own free-floating free currency or with a peg to the Deutschmark or reaching some other mutually agreed arrangement. This Europe would have been based on cooperation between sovereign states and it would have been pursued, that cooperation would have been pursued on a pick-and-mix basis as different countries chose. And that's the democratic aspect. It would also, though, have been based on competition, and this is the liberal aspect. There would have been a competition between currencies and tax and regulatory systems. This would ensure that, as in past centuries, the pressure was always to find the most economically efficient and business-friendly environments. And that, in turn, would push up economic growth. It would also devolve power so that the consequence of mistakes made by those who wielded it were minimised. As for foreign and security policy, individual European countries would cooperate in Western defence through NATO under American leadership without duplicating resources through rival Europe-based structures. By moving away from the one-size-fits-all blueprint of a fully integrated European Union, it would also make it easier to tailor arrangements to fit other states that wished to join. Instead, however, an illiberal and undemocratic model prevailed. This involved a single currency, a single interest rate set by a European central bank, a customs union and common trade policy rather than global free trade, protection for industry and price support for agriculture, a single system of regulation now embodied in the acquis communautaire rather than competing regulatory systems, and an ambitious but ineffective foreign policy and defence structure. Moreover, having embarked so far upon the path of centralised planning, all the pressure is always to advance still further along it. Anybody who remembers communism knows that the plan must always be continued with another plan and that the failures are always the failures of the people, not the failure of the plan. So it is in Europe. Throughout 
the Eurozone crisis, the only option considered truly unthinkable is apparently to break up the monopoly. The pressure instead is to increase the power of the central authorities over EU member countries. The officially sanctioned debate in Europe is merely about how far and by what means to do so. The essential problem of the European Union has, since the project's inception, been its prefer preference for top-down rather than bottom-up development. In fact, association between enthusiasm for a united Europe and authoritarian thinking is close, long-standing, and somewhat troubling. Now, Jean Monnet, a name that you all know well, the widely acknowledged father of Europe, can't, of course, be bracketed with authoritarians. But Monet's democratic credentials did not translate into what we would call liberal methods. Monet's view, which essentially reflected that of the intelligentsias of the West European powers in 1945, was that peace in the future could only be assured by suppressing the nation state, whatever nations themselves thought about the matter. This would be achieved by avoiding dramatic visions and sweeping generalities and by concentrating instead on the building of common European-wide institutions. Monet's private thinking, which is set out in detail in his memoirs, was given public expression <coughs> in the famous declaration by French Prime Minister Robert Schuman on the 9th of May, 1950. And in this, Schuman asserted that Europe would be built through concrete achievements which first create what he called a de facto solidarity. Now, what that means is that an apparently pragmatic collaboration between governments, above all, of course, the governments of France and Germany, had from the start an ideological goal. And so, piece by piece, this structure has been assembled. In 1951, the European Coal and Steel Community, that is cartel, was established under the Treaty of Paris by the six founding countries. In 1957, the creation of the European Economic Community enlarged that to the scope of an internal market and a tariff union, and supranational intervention was henceforth applied to a whole range of goods and services, crucially including agriculture. In 1973, the UK... Ireland and Denmark joined, but without securing any substantial changes in the common market's operation. And the later arrival of Greece in 1981 and Spain and Portugal in 1986 just reinforced the prevailing etatist ethos. In the early 1980s, under pressure from Mrs Thatcher, some progress was made with reform of European community finances. The single market program was then launched in order to remove so-called non-tariff barriers and thus create what was described as a real common market. Now, I remember this well. The free market British thought it was all their program. The interventionists and federalists ensured, however, that it quickly became theirs. The conditional quid pro quo of giving the European Commission more powers only so that it could promote competition was never honoured and enforced. The single market thus became a further means of centralised decision-making. <coughs> the fall of the Berlin Wall in 1989 and the collapse of the Soviet Union in 1991 meant, of course, a further transformation of the geopolitical framework of Europe. The European community had, over the Cold War years, made a modest contribution to the outcome, that is victory by the West, <coughs> simply by becoming rich, while Soviet-controlled Eastern Europe, as your parents will know well, stayed poor. Now, though, more was expected of the European Union. Europe did expand hesitantly 
to bring in new members, including Hungary in 2004. But this widening was never allowed to get in the way of deepening, as the jargon had it. The European Union, as it had now become, thus developed more and more functions proper to a federal state. A common foreign and security policy and a common security and defence policy were launched. Uh, equally significant, with many illiberal possibilities, was the rapid development of a European judicial area with institutions covering justice and home affairs, Eurojust, Europol, and the European Arrest Warrant. The drive towards the goal of a United States of Europe hasn't, of course, been without setbacks. But at each stage, economic pressure, as with the breaking of the European exchange rate mechanism in the early 1990s, has been met with some larger institutional leap forward, as with the creation of the Eurozone. <clears throat> well, as in 1975, and I was involved in that campaign, it was the first political operation I was involved in, hugely unsuccessful, but there we are, we, we learn from our mistakes, I suppose. Uh, as in 1975, a huge operation has been underway to frighten British public opinion into staying in. Cameron's um, Bloomberg speech contains uh, the sentence, uh, proponents of both sides of the argument will need to avoid exaggerating their claims. Well, this has not held him back at all. Um, in fact, everything from the war against terrorism to the price of socks to the possibilities of air travel, to the preservation of the British National Health Service has been thrown into what has been widely labelled in the press as Project Fear. Now, most of this stuff really constitutes no more than foolish propaganda that is devised by um, PR men and advertisers and who could blame them they have a living to earn. But there are, I suppose, some serious points which do need addressing and we must address them. Obviously, trade and jobs are the most important issue for most people. But the arguments here, you know, need to be got into proportion. As in most cases, and the only exception I can see here is immigration, where there is an overwhelming argument for Brexit, the ups and downsides of leaving the EU or staying in are quite finely balanced. Um, so it's really important that one shouldn't get carried away with the hysteria. Uh, the latest contribution to this um, hysteria has been a report from the uh, Treasury, uh, the United Kingdom Treasury, which suggests that, as you may have seen it uh, on the internet the last couple of days, which suggests that £1,400 is likely to be removed from the income of British families over the next few years if Britain was misguided enough to leave the European Union. Well, uh, the economist J.K. Galbraith managed to get most things wrong in his lifetime, but I think he was right about this when he said that the only function of economic forecasting is to make astrology look respectable. And I'm afraid that that is the case in, 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 in this matter. I remember, actually, when I was in the Treasury in the early 1980s, the internal Treasury forecasting uh, suggested that the economy was going to go down and down and down. This, you can imagine, was extremely dismal reading for the Chancellor of the Exchequer and, indeed, the Prime Minister. But luckily, it was all wrong, because, actually, after a while, the, government, the economy went up and up and up. I mean, the old phrase, of course, is garbage in, garbage out. And it does, of course, as with all these things, depend on the assumptions that you make. Well, this present, uh, the assumptions behind the, the, the present uh, forecast, basically, uh, are wrong in two respects. It, it is that in both, that, that in two cases, they assume that things are going to stay the same. First of all, it assumes that, in making this projection of, of, of the effect of Brexit, First of all, it assumes that the European Union is going to stay the same when we know that it is not, because in fact the plans are towards uh, for more regulation and more centralization, which is going to uh, create problems, which would create problems for Britain, for example, for the city of London. So we know that that is not the case. 
But we all, the other assumption is that the British economy, after leaving the European Union and being outside the tariff war, would stay the same. But of course it won't. Uh, it will adapt. And indeed the suggestion is that within the uh, tariff war, this tariff wall is much lower than it was. In 1973, when we went in, the exterior tariff wall was perhaps about three times as high as it is at the moment. The tariff wall now officially is 4%, but on a trade-weighted basis, it's 2.2%. But that actually is quite a lot uh, for uh, industries which are being feather-bedded. And the suggestion is that uh, under the present uh, arrangements for Britain within the European Union, uh, we are not actually uh, making the best of what Ricardo calls our relative advantage, and that, in fact, were we able to do so, we might actually get another 4% of GDP. But, of course, uh, we cannot... All these are hypothetical questions, uh, and they do depend on the assumptions. So I think it's better to look at the arguments than the figures which fly around. Well, the talk of what, if any, new agreement <laughs> would be reached... With the, of any new agreement that would be reached between the UK and the EU uh, should avoid all hysteria. The, e, the UK already trades with many countries like the US, Japan and China with which it has no special trade deal at all but trade simply operates under the rules of the World Trade Organization. <laughs> uh, Britain's trade deficit with the EU is getting worse but we have a growing trade surplus with the rest of the world. Uh, another change, of course, is in the EU itself. The EU is not, despite expansion, uh, expansion on population and the numbers of countries, is not the economic power it was when we joined. In 1973, it constituted 37% of world GDP, and it now constitutes 22%. Uh, Europe is aging and shrinking, unlike Britain, which is growing. In fact, probably growing at least demographically too fast through immigration. As Chancellor Merkel, no less, has noted, the combination of ageing, shrinking and overspending is highly problematic. To use her words, Europe accounts for just over 7% of the world's population, produces around 25% of global GDP and 50%, 50% of global social spending. So the EU is overspent. And the EU is also very heavily regulated. Now this regulation is the result of what's often called the single market, which sounds quite beneficent, but is better described as the acquis communautaire, which is a set of detailed rules. Now I don't know whether you know it, but this uh, acquis communautaire uh, constitutes no fewer than 170,000 pages of directives and regulations. Now, these are particularly onerous as regards energy, social legislation, and financial regulation. By one estimate, that of an organization called Open Europe uh, in 2011, which is not involved, incidentally, in campaigning on either side, EU social legislation in 2011 made the UK worse off by £15 billion, pounds, or about 1% of GNP. Now, I should say on that, that one, again, has to look at the other side of it, because obviously some of the regulation which is coming from Europe, Britain would want to impose itself. But it would be able to choose which legislation it wanted, and for example, on social and financial affairs, I'm sure it would want less. Now, it may be that some kind of trade deal would be reached that kept Britain part of this single market. But it's questionable if that would be desirable, as I've said. Um, and this is because the... The single market rules, these 170,000 pages of directives and regulations, they apply to the whole of the economy. They, they regulate the whole of every business that operates in the United Kingdom, as indeed in Hungary. But in the UK, unlike Hungary, uh, about 10 to 15 percent of our GDP is uh, directly accounted for by exports to Europe, but 85 to 90 percent of the GDP is not. But all of that, all of our economy, all of our economy, which is only serving uh, domestic consumers, is covered by that extra cost. That, of course, is extremely bad news, particularly for small firms. 
Well, I've mentioned that the, 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 question of the, uh, the question of the tariff wall, that is much less a problem than it was. Now, I can remember Mrs. Thatcher always used to say, well, trade is not between countries, trade is between people. And, of course, that is absolutely true. And a very important point, we, we think that we hear as if Germany is trading with Britain or Hungary is trading with Poland, but no. People in one country trade with people in another. And now, of course, with the uh, operation, the enormous expansion of trading on the internet, that is something that governments cannot control and that most of them do not actually know about. So the idea that you actually have to have detailed trading negotiations between one group and block with another is really extremely old-fashioned. And there is no reason why Britain should not, in my view, simply say we are going to abide by the rules set by the WTO, the World Trade Organization. And there the, the, the guarantee is uh, what's called uh, the uh, most favored nation provision. And most favored nation provision is that uh, any special trade deal that is given to one group or one country has to be offered to all other groups. It is the, it is the single biggest guarantee of open trade in the world and is the reason why tariffs have come down and the main reason why poor people have got so much wealthier and the capitalism has been able to operate internationally. Well, anyway, the other side of it is uh, how Britain gets out if it decides to get out. And here, as you've seen, the, the polls at the moment, from the polls were um, suggesting that the Brexit camp was ahead now the polls are suggesting that leave is ahead. And so I don't know what the result will be. All I feel is that it is going probably to be quite close. Uh, and it will depend, you may say this is true of all elections, but particularly on this uh, poll, uh, on turnout. And the reason I say that is that um, younger people uh, generally are, are more in favor of staying in the European Union. Older people, and when I say older people, I really don't just mean fossils like me and John. Uh, I mean, actually, it's sort of you know, people who are actually middle-aged people as well. In other words, not just people who are just put their feet up. I mean, really, we're talking about the middle section as well. That those people are uh, inclined to come out. And uh, the question there, of course, is which group is more likely to vote. Well, at the moment, the younger people are less driven to vote. So if we have a low turnout, I think Britain will be out. If we have a high turnout, I think Britain will be in. But anyway, if we are out, uh, this isn't some sort of plunge into, uh, in, in, into um, some desperate uh, whirlpool of, of, of disaster. It isn't at all. Because under Article 50 of the treaty, there then has to ensue two years of negotiation in order to establish what the relationship between the United Kingdom with the rest of the European Union, as it would then be, would be. It could even be longer than that if the negotiations began before somebody uh, uh, actually uh, operated the Article 50 provision. Well, how would this outcome affect the UK and Europe? Well, economically, as I think I've said, I think that Britain would be, I think it would be a little better off economically outside than inside. Uh, I don't think, it, it is complete rubbish to um, say that three or four million jobs, as the in campaign have been saying, depend upon uh, British membership of the European Union. This is to suggest that people uh, in Europe are not actually going to buy good British goods and services because uh, uh, Britain is no longer in the European Union. This is nonsense. Uh, it's not because of a political union that people buy cars or, or, or insurance or whatever it is. It's because it's good value. It will remain good value. And uh, I should say that uh, the risk, of course, is that uh, continental politicians might, in order to try to, uh, uh, well, in revenge to some extent, but also really in order to bolster their, their status uh, in, in, in European countries, they might, of course, want to try to impose some kind of uh, constraints and punishments and so on on Britain, despite WTO rules. Well, the people who will suffer will be people uh, who will lose their jobs within the European Union. So I would say that it was, for all of you, we, can't, we wouldn't be able to do anything about it, but all of the people actually in European countries would actually have to tell their politicians to stop being so childish. 
and just get on and get out of the way and allow us to have proper, uh, proper functioning economies and have uh, reasonably prosperous lives. Well, I think, though, that there is uh, some, um, some, uh, political, um, some political upside, actually, if Britain left. Um, Britain has almost no uh, influence anyway within present European structures. People who say, oh, it would be, they, they say this in a rather sort of flattering way to the Brits. They say, oh, well, if you left, you know, it would be so bad and this, that, and the other. But, I mean, what does our presence bring? Nothing very much, I think. Um, after all, we're not part of Euro, and thank goodness we're not part of Schengen. Uh, and uh, uh, Hungary is not part of the Eurozone. I certainly won't be crazy enough to go into it. Uh, but you're certainly feeling the consequences of uh, irresponsible German policies as regards immigration. So I would have thought that you could actually understand really why we really don't want to have any more of this than we need. But the point is that uh, the crises that are affecting Europe are not made in Britain to the extent they're made anywhere. I'm afraid they're made in Berlin. And this is, in fact, I suggest something you might like to think about. Uh, it isn't actually a German point. It's a, it's a point, an anti-German point. It's a point about the structure of Europe. And it comes back, really, to what I began by saying. Um, Europe, the European Union's model is centralised, bureaucratic, and anti-national. Now, I think it is for Central European countries including Hungary, not least Hungary, because Hungary is a, is a large and important country with a very strong national identity, um, to decide whether the movement towards uh, more centralization, and remember, more centralization means the more chance for really bad decisions to be made about your future by somebody else. Now, your own politicians are probably bad enough, but really being subordinated to other people's politicians isn't a good thing. And that really, when it comes down to it, that is why I, actually, in the end, would like Britain to be out. And I don't think probably that Hungary could ever be out or should ever be out for strategic uh, and, and um, strategic reasons, strategic and historical reasons. But I think that, that if we were to get out, it might be useful to make the political class think, well, perhaps something is wrong with this model. And at that point, it might be worth you thinking whether there isn't some kind of different arrangement within the European Union which would serve you better than the current one. Thank you.